We're in a sermon series right now called Transformation. And last week I talked about this hope that we have for transformation. That the hope is actually very inspiring. That hope that things won't, won't always be the same. That uh, we can experience a reality that's very different than our current reality. And that there's a place that we can live that is just not very far away from where we are right now. And there's this hope of transformation. I talked about um, the fact that Moses, uh, he, he began to realize that God was willing to transform him from a, sh a shepherd to a great leader, and it all started with a pause, that he simply paused long enough to be able to take a closer look at what was going on, and it was in that pause that he heard the whisper of God. And I said, you know, the same is true for us that oftentimes we live very busy lives. And it isn't until we pause, take a closer look at what we're really navigating, th that that's when we begin to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. Like Moses, we too have to realize that uh, um, it's not just about us, that it's about the people all around us. I ask the question, um, who is it in your network of relationships that would benefit by you transforming? That's a good question, but probably even a better question is, who is it in your network of relationship that is being negatively impacted by your lack of transformation? That's kind of a profound question. So as we take a look at it, we realize, hey, God wants to transform us, and it's not just about us, it's about the people all around us. And, uh, and, and that was true for Moses. And, and, and that Moses was simply being invited by God to partner with God. That that's, that's what God wants us to do, to partner with him in this transformation. It's not just um, us um, saying, okay, God, just transform me. God, God invites us into this partnership, and he's willing to overcome all of our inadequacies, all of our failures and our missteps and the times that we've tried before and, and failed. He's, he's willing to overcome all of those inadequacies in us if we will just simply say, God, I'm willing to partner with you. I know that there's, there's um, things that only you can do. You're God, and only you can really bring about the transformation that needs to happen in me. However, there are some things that you invite me to participate with you in doing. And that was, was Moses' story. You know, it was like God had already determined in his heart to set his people free. But he was looking for someone like Moses who would be willing to partner with him in that process. God was going to set them free. He already had a plan to do it but he was looking for Moses to simply partner with him on that journey. And, and so God already knows what he wants to do in your life. God already has a plan in place, but he's, he's wanting to know, are you willing to engage? Are you willing to engage in this partnership to see something happen inside of you that transforms you from the inside out? So that was last week. Now this week, uh, we're going to be talking about the practice of training. The practice of training. Now, there's, there are certain things that you can try, uh, but certain, certain things that you need to train for. Like, for example, you, you can try a new recipe. That it may or may not turn out, but you, you can try it, right? Um, you can try to fix an appliance. How many of you have done that? You've, you've, you've tried to fix an appliance. You can try that. Uh, you can try to fix a drone, for example. You can, you can try to do that. I, I um, crashed my drone again this summer. I, was, I had it up on the island. Fortunately, it did not go down in the water, it, but it, it landed right on a rock, and it broke. And I got an error message, and I could see that the camera was hanging, you know, in a place that, you know, it was broke. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to try to fix this myself. I'm just going to send it in. So I sent it in to a uh, DJI, which is the brand of the drone that I have, a DJI certified repair place. It was in Colorado. I sent it in. 
And uh, they told me they received it, but they, they diagnosed the problem and that this part needed to be replaced, but they needed um, to order the part. They didn't have it in stock and they were getting it from China. And so I said, well, how long? And they said, probably two to four weeks. Well, I waited for four weeks and I checked to see what the status was. And they said, we're still waiting on a part. And I said, well, how long? And they said, two to four weeks. And whoa, 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 you said two to four weeks four weeks ago. So is it more two to four weeks? And so then I went on Amazon and I found the part I needed and I could have it in two days. So I said to this guy, I said, I just went on Amazon, found the part, I can have it in two days. His response was, was well, if you want to buy it on Amazon and send it to me, I can fix your drone. <laughs> wow, it's, you're kidding me, right? And so I just said, send me back my drone. And so they did, they sent me back my drone. I, I had to pay a lot of money to get nothing done I bought my own part and I went on YouTube and I found out how to fix my drone. And I fixed it and, it, and I'm operational again. I'm, I'm up and running. Yeah, I'm up and running. So, so there are certain things you can try to do. You can try to do certain things and, and you may or may not succeed, but you can, you can try it. But there are other things that you probably um, you shouldn't try. Now, you can try to run, and you can try to swim, and you can try to ride a bike, but if you want to do a triathlon that involves running and swimming and biking, that you don't want to try in a triathlon. You want to train for a triathlon because a triathlon is like a 2.4-mile swim, it's a 112-mile bike ride, and it's a 26.2-mile run all in the same day. So you don't want to just try that. Well, you know, I think I'm going to go ahead and try, a, you know, an Iron Man. I'm going to go ahead and try that, you know. No, you don't try to be an Iron Man. You train to be an Iron Man. And so you have to put in a lot of work. Now, there are other things that require training in life. If you're going to be good at it, if you want to be good playing a musical instrument, you, you're going to need to train. You're going to have to practice and train. If you want to um, be uh, good at running a business, there are certain training that, that you need to go through if you're going to run a business. Or uh, there are other significant challenges in life to include spiritual growth. If you want to truly engage in spiritual growth and spiritual transformation, you don't just try that. That's something you have to engage in the practice of training. Spiritual transformation is not the result of trying. It's the result of training wisely. Now, today we're going to look at an excerpt from Paul's letter to his friend Timothy out of uh, 1 Timothy. And um, a little background, Timothy was a young man that Paul met in the town of Lystra, and, and that's up in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and he probably met him on his first missionary journey. That's probably when Timothy became a follower of Jesus, but it wasn't until his second missionary journey that Paul actually invited Timothy to accompany him on that journey, and so Timothy went with them. He traveled with them and became one of Paul's closest companions. In fact, in, on his third missionary journey, uh, Timothy was with him. He was with him during Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. And then at some point, Paul sent him to Ephesus. And if you'll remember, Ephesus was a port town. It was, it was a huge metropolis. And Paul really loved Ephesus. He spent a lot of time there, probably three years or more, in Ephesus, establishing the church there. And at some point, Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus to be the pastor of that young church there. And so now he writes Timothy this letter, and it's really he's training Timothy to be a pastor. He's encouraging him and training him on how to be a good pastor in the city of Ephesus. 
And so we're going to read this passage, and, and then we'll come back and just draw a few points out of it as it relates to training spiritually, okay? So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6, look at what it says. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you'll be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. That is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures in the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage of scripture that um, Paul wrote to Timothy and we now have a chance to wrestle with. Father, I pray that you would give us insight and wisdom as we dive into this. God, I pray that those of us who are really interested in growing spiritually, God, I pray that we would walk away from this morning uh, having been challenged, and God, that we would um, sense some next steps that you have in mind for us, and that you would give us the courage to take those steps and uh, that we would truly partner with you in the transformation that you want to bring about in our lives. So, Father, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. 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 Paul gives Timothy some great advice here regarding spiritual training that would result in transformation. So if you have your programs, you want to follow along, take some notes, you can pull them out of the program. Um, the, the handout that was in the program that you, that you received on the way in, and we'll, we'll start filling in some blanks. Here's, here's the first idea I want to talk about. Number one, uh, don't get distracted. When it comes to uh, training and spiritual transformation, it's important that we're not distracted. He says to Timothy in, in verse 7, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Don't get distracted. Don't, don't spend time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Now, uh, Timothy... Um, he, he was in a church in Ephesus, and he was dealing with a lot of different influences. Um, there was uh, Greek mythology that he was dealing with, and so there was a lot of um, uh, opportunity for conversation regarding that. He was dealing with Judaizers, um, 
people who were of Jewish traditional faith that were trying to bring old covenant ideas and mix them with a new covenant reality. And he was dealing with all of these false teachers trying to blend these two covenants into a unique kind of expression of faith that was not Christianity at all. He was dealing with all kinds of fables and superstitions, old wives' tales. You know, there was just so many opportunities to be baited into a conversation that was meaningless and fruitless and would not go anywhere, but just distract you from really engaging on a spiritual journey that would result in transformation. And, and Paul says, don't get distracted by these things. Don't, don't give them... Um, any time. Don't, don't invest any emotional energy in these things. Now, we in our culture, there, there are a lot of different things that we could engage in debate over regarding faith, tradition, and the church, and it's happened for years, hasn't it? Um, the, the, age old, <laughs> the age old debate over like the organ or the drums, Man, how many of you remember this debate? I mean, if you've been in church for any length of time, when all of a sudden a drum kit showed up on the platform, you would have thought that all hell broke loose. You know, it's like, what are we doing inviting, you know, the Satan's music? You know, in fact, how many of you remember the whole line that Satan had a beat? There was a beat? There was a satanic beat? You remember this? I, th this was very prevalent when I was a kid growing up, that there were certain beats you had to stay away from. And I'm not, I'm not sure which one it was, but there was a certain beat that Satan owned that beat. I, I remember when I went to a church to candidate as a pastor, they were looking for a lead pastor, and I was going, and I was just candidating, you know. And uh, so right after I spoke on a Sunday, they had the potluck, and so we were in line for the potluck right before the time of question and answers where the congregation was going to be able to grill me. And as I'm standing in line at the potluck, a gal next to me said, you're not going to change our music, are you? I said, well, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, we have any, this is, this is potluck time. I mean, I... I haven't got my food yet, and she, she's wanting to know if I'm going to change the music. And she said, well, I just think the world has its music, and the church has its music, and too many churches are playing worldly music. I went, oh, oh. I said, well, I think you and I just fundamentally disagree. She said, we do? I said, I think we do. I said, I'm a person who believes that music is amoral. It's neither right nor wrong. You like the notes on the page this way. Somebody else likes the notes on the page this way. It's not an issue of one's right and one's wrong. It's just different. It's a matter of personal preference. That's all it is. It's personal preference. The only thing that makes a song um, God-honoring or not God-honoring are lyrics. That's it. It's, it's, not, it's not the musical beat. It's not the melody. It is, it is the lyric. And so I think that you and I um, just disagree. Well, she didn't hardly even make it through the potluck, you know, because she could tell where this train was headed. And uh, so these are debatable issues that really, it's, it's really not an issue of right or wrong. It's, a, it's an issue of personal preference. That's what it is. It's an issue of personal preference. Um, speaking style, you know, how someone communicates. Um, there are some people that are manuscript communicators, and, and they are, I mean, content-rich I'm an extemporaneous. I, I don't know if you've noticed this, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I don't fly by the seat of my pants. Actually, I do have, I have notes up here that I, I actually have a track that I'm running on. I have a train of thought. I have scriptures that I've kind of lined out. And I, I have a message that I want to communicate that I believe is biblically um, founded. And so, uh, but, but there are different, there are different styles of communication, and so some people like this, some people like this. It's not an issue of right or wrong. It's just what is your personal preference in the way you receive godly principles communicated. And so there are a lot of people that like to get into all kinds of debates over this kind of stuff. And it's just, it is a distraction. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, 
Don't allow yourself to get distracted. Don't get into all these godless debates that don't have anything to do with anything. Just stay focused. Don't get distracted. Here's number two. Don't be spiritually lazy. Don't be spiritually lazy. Look what he says, starting in verse 8. He says, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy statement, a saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. He says physical training is good, but, but training for godliness is better. He says, he says that, um, you know, that when you, when you train physically, and, and Timothy would have been very familiar with physical training because he was in Ephesus. And so Ephesus, in fact, all towns that were Greek-influenced, um, physical training was a big part of their civil life. In fact, um, the gymnasium in a Greek-influenced city would have been the center of civic life. I mean, people going there and training and working out. In fact, in Ephesus, it was known to the great theater, and the great theater is where the gladiators would fight. And so these guys were like pumping iron all over the place, right? And they were, they were getting ready for, the, for the, the gladiator fights. And so this was permeating the culture. In fact, in Ephesus, there, there, were, um, there was a version of the Olympic Games, uh, second only in size to those in Greece itself. And so, so training, physical training, was, uh, there was a high value placed on it. So Paul is using now a metaphor that Timothy would have been very familiar with and, and the people Timothy was reaching out to would have been very familiar with. So he's saying physical training is good. It's good. But training for godliness is better because physical training only benefits you now. But training for godliness benefits you now and in the life to come. So training for godliness benefits you in both places. You know, it's interesting, you know, um, physical training, uh, there are people that are really into it and people that aren't so much, right? And in fact, sometimes we even try to uh, incentivize ourselves uh, by buying exercise equipment or uh, joining a gym. But, but <laughs> how many of you know those things take effort? No one, no one has ever lost weight because they joined a club. No one has ever lost weight because they bought exercise equipment. No one. Because it requires effort. You actually have to use this stuff, right? You, you have to make an effort. In fact, I was reading an article, and this, I found this kind of interesting. Um, things that don't sell at garage sales. You know what was number three on the list? Right behind ugly vases and old upholstered furniture. <laughs> Exercise equipment. Exercise equipment, uh, they, it doesn't sell at garage sale. I, you know why? Because exercise equipment that's not used, it just takes up space. And I think what happens is someone at some time had the best of intentions and they bought exercise equipment and then they, it didn't get used and so now it's at the garage sale and, and, and they're trying to push it out at the garage sale, but then people know, you know, listen, it's taking up space in your house. If I buy it, it's just going to take up space in my house, right? And so we have to realize that this stuff requires effort if we're going to um, actually reap the benefit. Uh, in fact, I was talking to a friend of mine who is a triathlete about this message this weekend, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the difference between training and trying and and he says, oh, yeah. He said, um, the course does not lie. The course does not lie. It reveals. You can say you've been training, but the course is not going to lie. It's going to reveal whether or not you have, in fact, been training. 
And I thought, there's a lot of truth to that. You can say a lot of things, but the course reveals the truth. And you know, in life, there's going to be a fair amount of difficulty that we navigate. The course that we're running in life will have some ups and downs, some highs, some lows. There are going to be some significant challenges and hills that have to be climbed. And the course, it doesn't lie. It just reveals. And, and whether or not we have been engaged in spiritual practices, whether or not we have been engaged in a process of being transformed from the inside out, Those things are revealed when all of a sudden, in the course of life, we run into some obstacles, some difficulties, some uphill climbs. That's when what's really on the inside gets revealed. So we have to come to a place where we recognize that, you know, spiritual laziness at some point, is going to be revealed in our lives. That's why I think uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians what he did in 1 Corinthians 9.25. He says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. See, he recognized that spiritual laziness at some point will be revealed as life becomes difficult. And he did not want that to happen in his life. I don't know what you're going through. I know that when you navigate difficult times, it reveals what's already there. It reveals. You you navigate a season of difficulty. Maybe your marriage, you've not not made the kind of investment that you need to make in strengthening your marriage. And so there are unresolved issues, unresolved issues in your marriage. Then you come on to a rough patch and all of a sudden, You've got problems. There's all this tension. Those unresolved issues were there, right? They were there all the time. This increased pressure and difficulty and challenge, it didn't cause that. It simply revealed that. And that can be applied in a lot of different areas of your life where suddenly you find yourself navigating something very challenging, something very difficult, and all of a sudden the imperfections and the unresolved issues that were there the whole time, they begin to surface. This didn't cause them, it just simply revealed them. Does that make sense? Didn't cause them, just revealed them. So the answer then is, Knowing that life can be challenging, knowing that we're going to be thrown some curveballs in life, knowing that there's going to be some uphills on the course of life that we're going to have to just dig deep and find it and and get to the top to summit, knowing that that's true, we ought to be training, engaged in the practice of training so that when those things do happen, then we have something to draw upon that will get us through 
those difficult seasons because spiritual laziness will be revealed. Here's number three. We need to focus on what matters most. As we're thinking about um, engaging in this practice of training, we need to focus on what matters most. If you're training for a tri triathlon, then you're going to be focused on your, your swim time, your bike time, and your running time. Those are the things you're going to be focused on because you want to drop those as low as you can because you're going to be doing this all in one day and there are, there are cutoffs. And so you have to, you have to make it past that, that, that threshold by a certain time so you know that if you can get your, your swim time to here, your bike time to here, and your run time to here, you know you're going to be able to finish that race. So that's, that's what you focus on. But what about... What about other um, things? Like if you're training vocationally, uh, there are certain skill sets or policies or procedures that you need to become proficient at if you're going to really excel and, and do well. And so that then would be reflected in your training. But what about spiritually? See, spiritual training is not just about biblical knowledge. I think this is really, really important. Spiritual training is not just about biblical knowledge. It's not about how much of the Bible you know. It's about the practical application of godly principles. That's what it's about. Not just about biblical knowledge. It's not what you know. It's about what you put into practice because that's where transformation happens. It's when God through his spirit and, and his word begins to make us aware of principles that we need to apply in our life. As that begins to happen and we begin to apply those principles in our life, that's when transformation becomes real. That becomes the catalyst for transformation. It's practicing these principles. It's, it's in the way we live out our lives. Not just what we know, but what we live. Look what, look what Paul says to Timothy in verse 11. He says, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Then look what he says. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. And until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. So it's in what we say, it's in how we live, it's in uh, the capacity to love. These are the things that we really focus on when it comes to spiritual transformation. It's not just Bible knowledge for knowledge's sake, it's in, is it affecting how we speak in, in the things that we say? Is it affecting the way we live our lives? Is it increasing our capacity to love God and to love others? Are we becoming more loving individuals? This is the main thing when it comes to spiritual transformation. And you've, and you've heard me say this before, and I, I'm just going to keep harping on it until I see changes. But, you know, there are people that call themselves followers of Jesus, and then they vent in very unchristlike ways on social media. I mean, it's amazing some of the things that you read on social media. And there isn't an ounce of grace in any of it. It does not reflect the love of Jesus. And so, again... There's a lot of things that you can say, <laughs> but the course reveals the truth. The course of life reveals the truth. And so if in spiritual transformation, the main thing is that we are growing as people and it's being reflected in how we say things. Are they seasoned with grace? Are our words seasoned with grace? Are they... Are they reflective of a loving Savior? In the way we live our lives out, does it, are our lives being lived in a way that reflects a loving Savior? You know, how, how are we living our lives out? Are we reflecting Jesus um, in those ways? Are, are we increasing in our capacity to love God? 
and love people. That's what Jesus said is the most important thing. Look, in, in response to what's the greatest commandment, remember what he said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is equally important. So really, we have two number ones here. He's saying it's equally important. Here's the first and greatest, but the second is equally important. It says um, that we should love your neighbor as yourself, and the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Those two Everything, he wraps it all up. He summarizes everything that the law and the prophets were trying to say. He said, man, if you will just hone in on this and increase capacity to love God and increase capacity to love people, man, if you will just hone in on that, then all of the law and prophets, all of it will be fulfilled in that. That's the reason why Paul told the Corinthians, man, without love, everything else that you do is like, just obnoxious noise. Look what he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 3. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels and didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge... And if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Without love, all of these other things, these exterior kind of wrappings, these, this packaging, all of this superficial packaging is nothing if at the center of who we are is not loving and growing in our capacity to love God and love others. In fact, Jesus was so adamant about this. Look what he said to his followers in John 13, 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Your love for one another. So, before I finish with my last thought, let me just say this. Everything that we're talking about during this series, all of the practices that we're going to be kind of honing in on, again, if, um, if we're not careful, this could be approached like a self-help kind of uh, thing, and, um, and so I'm just going to check the boxes on attendance, on this practice, this practice, this practice. That's, that's not what this is about. What this is really about is inviting Jesus, creating environments to invite Jesus into the heart of us to transform us into more loving people, more grace-filled people, people who stay away from being mean-spirited and judgmental, people who are willing to walk with people, people who are more in touch with their own brokenness, and we invite Jesus and his spirit into our own brokenness to begin to heal that, so that when we come in contact with broken people, we can recognize that right away because we know ourselves as being broken and God's in the process of putting us back together and he's transforming us. And so because we're in touch with that, we extend great grace and forgiveness and we respond to people in very loving ways, very kind ways. You, 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 know, what, you know what I think God wants to do? I think God wants to transform us into the most loving people on the planet. That's what I think. I think God wants to transform his followers into the most loving people on the planet so that we can come alongside anyone and walk with them on a journey of transformation. 
born out of a place of love and grace and acceptance. And we say, uh, because God has done all of that for us and is in the process of transforming us and helping us increase our capacity to love him and to love others, we come alongside you and we, we desire that for you as well. We desire that you would give him permission to begin to transform you as well. Here's my last thought. Number one, we've got to be all in. We've got to be all in. Look what he says to Timothy, verse 15. He says, give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourselves into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. He says, throw yourself in to your tasks. Keep a close watch on how you live. You gotta, you gotta really know what you want. You gotta really know that this is what I really want to see happen in my life and I'm gonna throw myself completely into it. You know, there's a great book out there. It's called Willpower Doesn't Work. Willpower Doesn't Work. It's written by Benjamin Hardy, and I just want to read an excerpt. Listen to what he says. He says, according to the American Psychological Association's annual stress in America survey, a lack of willpower is frequently cited as people's top reason for not achieving their goals. Researchers across the globe are studying how people develop willpower and overcome willpower depletion. To be frank, willpower is for people who haven't decided what they actually want in their lives. That's an interesting statement. Willpower is for those who haven't decided what they actually want. So, like, I want to eat healthy, but I want the cookie. Right? I want, I want financial freedom, but I also want the latest, greatest, newest, and best, whatever. I want to be more present with my kids, but I also want to surf social media, and I want to make sure that I know what's the latest thing on Pinterest, right? So, so willpower then, follow me, willpower then becomes this source of strength that we try to tap into to do what we don't want to do. That true? Willpower becomes that source of strength that we try to tap into to do what we don't want to do. Here's our problem. We don't know what we want. We've not yet decided what we really want. And because we have things competing we have competing wants. And because we live in the ambiguity of competing wants, we never get traction. We never go anywhere. Because we don't know what we want. That was interesting when Jesus came alongside the guy that was at the pool. Remember this? He was at the pool. He'd been there for years and years and years. And, and he says to the guy, what do you want? Now, that seems to be a foolish question. I mean, he's been crippled for years, sitting by the pool, hoping to get in the pool when the waters were troubled so that he could receive some kind of miracle. And yet Jesus, I, I don't think, see, Jesus doesn't ask stupid questions. He said, what do you want? What do you really want? And I think today, he would ask us the same. What do you want? Have you really decided? Maybe your lack of traction spiritually is the result of ambiguity. You haven't really decided what you want. Once you decide, you need to understand that nothing's going to just happen. God's looking for people who are willing to partner with him in this process of transformation. 
where he will lead us in some practices that we can engage in that creates the environment for us to be able to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit in our lives and begin to take steps that represent obedience. And when we commit every step to him, we wind up in a destination of his choosing and he transforms us from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, today, I pray that you would help us as we reflect on our spiritual journey. God, I pray that you would help us be honest whether or not we're really getting traction or maybe we're high-centered. Father, maybe that high-centeredness is the result of being distracted. We've been engaging in meaningless debates that really have distracted us from being able to engage in spiritual transformation. Father, for some, maybe, maybe laziness has set in. We've become complacent. Father, I pray that you would bring us to a place where we can really evaluate where we're at and focus on what really matters. God, that we would be able to evaluate our actions and, and assess whether or not we're becoming more loving people who are loving you and increasing in our capacity to love others. Father, I pray that we would determine what we really want and that we would push everything to the center of the table and we would say, we're all in. We're going to throw ourselves in and say, God, transform us. And we're willing to make the effort because training requires effort. And we're willing to do that, God, knowing that this isn't a uh, fix myself endeavor, but it's a partner with you endeavor and creating environments where we are more apt to hear what it is you wanna say to us so that you can reveal next steps and we can take them and as a result, be transformed. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today that's on the very front end of their spiritual journey and they have yet to really put their trust and faith in what Jesus did on the cross for them when he died for all of their sins, God, I pray that that would happen today, that they would simply whisper a prayer to you and say, God, I want you to be the leader of my life and I want what Christ did on the cross to be applied to my life. Forgive me of my sins because of what Christ did on that cross. Forgive me. I want to walk with you. I want to become the person you created me to be. And for all of us, God, just help us. Help us. Transform us into the people that you created us to be, I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. amen.